Hey everybody, this is Patrick JMT. I'm partnering with Chegg. And in this video, we're gonna talk about calculating limits using the limit laws. So I'm briefly gonna uh, run through the limit laws. There's a bunch of them. You don't wanna sit here and you know watch me talk about them all, but we'll run through them just so you have them. We'll talk about evaluating limits, some common examples, and the squeeze theorem. I think these two topics will be what most people, are the topics most people wanna see. Okay, so the limit laws. We're all talking about evaluating limits and sort of what's legal and what's not legal. So um, C is a constant and the limit as X approaches A of F of X and the limit as X approaches A of G of X exists, then how do we evaluate limits? It's, I would say, intuitive. It's what I think a lot of us would do naturally if we had no idea. So if you have addition or subtraction between functions, it says just evaluate the limits individually and then combine them. If you have a constant, you can just pull the constant out front. And there's others as well. You can look. If you have a product, for example, you can just take the limit of each function respectively and then multiply. So there's something important called the direct substitution property. And it says if f is a polynomial or a rational function, and I'm going to say there's other functions that this extends to, not just polynomial or, ration, or, polynomial or rational functions. But for now, um, if you have a polynomial or a rational function and that value a is in the domain, if you want to find the limit as x approaches a of the function, it says just plug a into the function. That's all you got to do. So for example, if we had the limit as x approaches 2 of 5x squared minus 3x plus 1, well, this is a polynomial. They are continuous everywhere. We can just plug 2 in. So I would have 5 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1. And again, notice we're using these limit laws, right? This constant, it says I can pull out front. I can uh, evaluate the limits individually. And I'm not writing down every single limit law, but I'm allowed to do this because of those laws. So 2 squared is 4 times 5 is 20. This is 6. 20 minus 6 is 14 plus 1 will give us a limit of 15. So very often when you're first doing limits in a calculus course, you'll try to, I always tell people, even if it's not a polynomial, the first thing I always do is just plug in that value. So in this case, x was approaching to, I plugged in x equals two into that function. No matter what function it is, that's the very first thing I do. Very often you'll get, when you plug that number in, you'll get zero over zero. That doesn't mean that the limit doesn't exist. It just means you have to try some other stuff. So some common things that work, factoring and reducing, expanding and simplifying, if you have square roots, especially with a couple terms, multiply by a conjugate. So in my first example, I have the limit <clears throat> as x approaches 5 of x squared minus 6x plus 5 over x minus 5. Notice if you plug in 5 squared minus 6 times 5 plus 5, in the numerator I'm going to get 0, and it's pretty clear that you're going to get 0 in the denominator as well. So, okay, well, what could I do? This looks like a factoring and canceling problem. So I could factor x squared minus 6x plus 5 as x minus 5 multiplied by x minus 1. And I always tell people, if you're getting 0 over 0, that means there's a factor in common for these types of rational functions. So if you see an x minus 5 in the denominator, there's going to have to be an x, uh, a factor of x minus 5 in the numerator as well. Well, I could just cancel out those factors of x minus 5, and I'm left with a limit as x approaches 5 of just x minus 1. But now I can substitute in this value of 5, so I have 5 minus 1, and now we get 4 as the value of that limit. <clears throat> so the next one, the limit as h approaches 0 of 5 plus h squared minus 25 over h. Again, notice if you plug in h equals 0, you'd have 5 squared, which is 25 minus 25, which would be 0 over 0. Well, if you're not sure what to do, at least I could, you know, um, I can multiply out 5 plus h times 5 plus h. That's what I have as my first term. That's going to be 25. So 5 times 5 is 25. We'll get a 5h, another 5h. So we'll have 10h. And then we would have plus h squared. We still have our minus 25 left over. Okay, the 25s will cancel. Now, I can do a little bit more algebra because still if I plug in h uh, equals 0, I'm going to get 0 over 0. But I can factor an h out from the numerator and be left with 10 plus h over h. And again, more algebra. The h's cancel. 
I'm left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 10 plus h. If I plug in h equals 0, I'll get 10 plus 0, or the value of my limit will be 10. Okay, one more example before we go on to another technique called the squeeze theorem. So here I've got the square root of 9 plus h minus 3 over h. Well, you know, in my other example, I had it raised to a power of 2. I could multiply that out. It doesn't feel like there's a lot to do in this case. And again, let me emphasize, if you plug in h equals 0, you'll get 0 over 0. So in this case, I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. And I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. And recall the conjugate, all you do is change the sign between the two terms. So I've got the square root of 9 plus h, I still have it. Instead of a minus 3, I'm going to have a plus 3. Well, if I multiply it in the numerator, I've got to multiply it in the denominator to keep, keep the math gods happy. And now the idea is in the numerator we can distribute. So the square root of 9 plus h times 9 plus, the square root of 9 plus h is just going to give us 9 plus h. Now notice we'll get a positive 3 square root of 9 plus h. Then we're also going to get a negative 3 square root of 9 plus h. And those are going to cancel out. So that's what happens when you multiply by the conjugate. And then I'll get negative 3 times positive 3, which is negative 9. The denominator I'm going to leave alone. And this is typical. Don't, don't distribute that out. And again, because we want things to factor and cancel. That's what we're trying to do. So notice my 9s cancel. Um, notice I could even cancel out the h's, because I would just be left with an h at that point. So I would have the limit as h approaches 0. There is still a 1 in the numerator. Don't, don't make that a 0. Plus 3. And now we just plug in h equals 0. We would get 1 over the square root of 9 plus 0, or 1 over the square root of 9. We still have our plus 3 left over. Well, the square root of 9 is 3, so we would have 1 over 3 plus 3, or 1 over 6. So again, a common mistake, I would say... Um, if there's a common mistake here, people will plug in that value and they'll say, oh, it's 0 over 0, and that means that the limit does not exist. Which, <clears throat> as we've seen on all these examples, that's not true. So just because you're getting 0 over 0, that doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. So don't, don't fall into that trap. There's definitely more to do. So let's talk about the squeeze theorem briefly as well. Okay, suppose I'm looking at the limit as x approaches some number a. Suppose I've got some function here. I'll call that, uh, we'll call this f of x. And let's suppose the y value, suppose this is the value a comma l. So there's l. Now I've got another function here. I'm going to call it g of x. And notice that I have that g of x is less than or equal to f of x for x values near a. It doesn't have to be everywhere, just sort of in this vicinity is all we're talking about. Suppose we have another function in between there. Suppose I've got another function in between there. Now, based on the graph, I know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. And I also know that the limit as x approaches a of g of x equals l. Suppose I also know that my middle function, what do we call that? We'll call that h of x. Suppose my h of x is, well, its y values are greater than or equal to the y values on g of x, but they're less than or equal to the y values on f of x. This is the idea of the squeezing. If you know the limit of the big function, f of x, and by big I mean larger y values, and if you know the limit of the smaller function, g of x, we, if we know that as x approaches a, that's also l. For our, fun, our function that's squeezed in between them, that tells us that so also the limit as x approaches a of h of x, that also has to equal l. And again, based on the picture, right, that seems correct. They're, they're sort of getting squeezed in at that x value of a. So you'll see these questions often. If you see a limit problem on a quiz or a test and you're like, oh, geez, I have no idea, but you see a sine or a cosine, this is going to be a very typical trick. So notice um, sine of pi over x. And again, I'm emphasizing for x values not equal to 0 because we don't, we don't care what happens at x equals 0. We care about what happens for x values <clears throat> near 0. That's our, that's our focus.
So for x not equal to 0, we're keeping that in mind here. Well, sine of anything is between positive 1 and negative 1. Okay? If you think about the range, okay. Well, if I multiply both sides by the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared, I would get the following. So then I would have the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared multiplied by sine of pi over x. It would say that's less than or equal to the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared. So I'm just making this observation that it's between negative one and positive one. And then I'm just multiplying that whole, all, that, that, that whole inequality by the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared. But now the idea is we're going to focus on the limits on the outside. So if I look at the limit as x approaches 0 of negative square root of x to the fourth plus x squared, so this is not a polynomial, but for this one, I, I promise we're still allowed to plug in x equals 0. Notice if we plug in 0, we're just going to get the square root of 0. We're going to get that limit to be 0. Well, notice for the one on the right as well, if I look at the limit here, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared. Again, I can plug in 0. I'm going to get 0 out. So I know the limit on the left side, it's going to 0. I know the limit on the right side, it's going to 0. So you could say by the squeeze theorem, so also the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x to the fourth plus x squared times sine of pi over x, that also has to equal 0. So keep an eye out for these types of limit questions um, early on in your Calc 1 career. You know, people like to ask these limit questions. If you see something funky with sine or cosine, you, again, you'll bound it by negative 1 or 1. Or, you know, if this had been a sine squared, for example, then you could have bounded it by 0 and 1. So just keep an eye out for that. These are very common techniques for limits, again, factoring and reducing, expanding and simplifying, multiplying by a conjugate. We didn't have an example, but sometimes if you have fractions, you know, combine fractions and simplify, that's another common technique. And there's other ways as well, for sure. But these are some of the, definitely some of the highlights. If, you, if, if you're new to this, these are a great starting point. So, okay, all right, a little introduction to limits. The squeeze theorem, you'll see it a little bit. You're not going to use it that often, I would say, most likely. But it's one of those, just keep it in your back pocket because it may crop up.